Martin, I might not you just hang out with me. Can you just stay today? You didn't wear that pretty shirt to go hide in the back somewhere. He looks good this morning. Y'all feel okay this morning? Feel okay? Some of your parents, you parents, you sent your kids to prom last night. You okay? You make it? Y'all smiled for the picture. Mom got mad at dad because he was just wearing shorts and a t-shirt and went putting something on for the picture. All the kids are sitting like this. Y'all okay? We'll see. Y'all gonna have to help me out this morning. We can just stay here all day. I don't mind. I got nothing to do. Me and Bishop just hanging out this morning. We'll stay and we'll make it real awkward when we get up to leave. I'm just playing. I'm so excited this morning to share the word with you. Uh, as Pastor Catherine said, uh, me and a few of our men went to a uh, men's conference in Dallas, and it was everything I could have expected and more. And then, and I mean, they're just getting you fired up. And I'm like, I'm supposed to come back this morning and preach about, like, joy and peace. <laughs> but we're running through a wall. Like, I'm going to need y'all to come with me, all right? Y'all good? Come on, wake up a little bit, guys. See, what's great about the presence of God is, is, is there's moments for a calm. And then there's moments for spirit, and then there's mo- he can do anything and everything in every moment. So what we have to do as believers is learn when to shift with the Holy Spirit. So when he has us in a moment of healing, heal. And then when he has you in a moment of encouragement, get encouraged. And when he has you in a moment to pick up the fight, pick up the fight. And when he has you in a moment to honor and glorify his name, give him everything you've got. We shift with the Holy Spirit this morning. Amen? Well, this morning, I'm going to continue part two of a series we began last last week called Echoes of Eden. In Echoes of Eden, we were talking about a comparison of two gardens. The original Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve, uh, they came to their own will. They neglected the will of the Father. They fell to their sin. They fell to their desire. But then we looked at a a picture of a garden in the New Testament, at the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus said, God, not my will, but your will be done. And he laid everything that he was down at the feet of the Father. How these choices that we make in these key moments of our lives can echo throughout eternity in the rest of who we are. How the choices that we make can reverberate generation after generation. When we make a decision to say, God, not my will, your will be done. We talked about a couple of concepts in the garden, first off being boundaries, that our God is a God of boundaries. He puts boundaries on this earth and boundaries in the heavens and and boundaries of, of physics and nature to keep us safe and protected. And he does the same thing with our personal lives. And he puts boundaries on our hearts and on our will and our emotions for our own good because he loves us and he cares for us and he knows what's out on the other side. He sets these boundaries that, now I wanted to come back to that a little this morning because sometimes we think that God's punishing us when we step outside of the boundaries. An umbrella doesn't punish you with rain when you decide to step outside of underneath it. I'll let that sink in for a second. An umbrella is not punishing you when it's raining outside and you decide to do this. No, you stepped outside of the covering of the umbrella, and you got wet. God doesn't punish us. He just knows what the rules of earth are. How when you reap, you sow. He knows what what, what comes back in our lives. He knows what's good for you. He knows what's going to happen. See, it's not don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, just because. It's because he knows better. You realize even in in the old Levitical law, You realize back in one of these laws is you weren't allowed to circumcise a child until the eighth day. Don't do that. And we're like, well, that's a weird rule, God. Why are we we so worried about that? Until later on, we find out that a newborn baby, their blood couldn't coagulate until day eight. He's saying, saying, no, no, don't do that because you can't heal from that. And you could look at it, it's just a trivial law, a trivial rule. One of of the laws he put in place, he said, hey, when you're washing your hands, always use running water. Really, God? Like, that's a law? That's a rule? I got to have some running water? Have you ever washed your hands in a bowl of water? What does that water look like? How many of y'all taking baths? That's nasty. 
Like if I'm going to take a bath, i got to take a shower and then take a bath. Because <laughs> you're just taking like a filth stew. Yeah, there's going to be moments where you're not going to know what to play. It's okay. Just in and out. We're good. Um, <laughs> there's not a chord for that. Um, you realize in the bubonic plague that wipes out two-thirds of Europe, they estimate that the majority of the deaths came because the physicians were washing their hands in bowls of still water and then taking their hands to the next person and infecting them. But see, there was a Levitical law written many, many years ago that said, hey, guys, uh, use running water, please. See, his boundaries are for our own protection, even when they seem trivial, even when they seem, God, why? That's why we made the statement last week that we're not going to diminish the capacity of his lordship to the capacity of our understanding. Just because I don't understand a law or his word doesn't mean I get to ignore it and then blame him saying he's punishing me or putting me through a test. The test was on the cross. Jesus passed it. You're testing yourself. You're testing boundaries. You're testing the will of God. And what comes back to us comes back to us. Always remember the removal from the garden was because Adam and Eve were now in a condemned state. The removal from the garden was not punishment. It was mercy. Because right next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the tree of life. And if they had chosen to eat from the tree of life while already in a damned state, there would be no point of redemption. He did not move them out to punish them. He moved them out to protect them. So he put an angel in front of that the tree of life now with two flaming swords to say, no, you can't get here till Christ gets to you. His boundaries are for us. We talked about the element of sacrifice, Jesus in the garden. God, not my will, but yours be done. I don't want to do this, but I'll do it for you. If there's any way to let this cup pass for me, please take it. But not my will, but your will be done. Now, Christ takes on the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate weight that we don't have to carry. But he still calls us to sacrifice. He still calls us to sacrifice things in our life. We talked about sacrificing your lips, sacrificing your livelihood, sacrificing your life, your every day for him, for all that he is. But then where we pick up today is how was he able to make that sacrifice? He gave up his, his divinity in that moment. He didn't do it as God. He did it as a man, grieved, exhausted, crushed. So here's how he did it. You want to know the secret? I'm not rhetorical, okay? I ask you answer. Or I sit. Lubies gets out late. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, therefore, remember, therefore always means something happened before this. What happened before this is the writer of Hebrews is speaking about how, how looking forward Abraham was to the building of a new city on the foundations of God. How God had these promises that were set before every single person coming up all the way through the Old Testament to now. And he said, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For the joy that is set before him. There are boundaries in the garden. There is sacrifice in the garden. But there is joy in the garden. There is a joy in the will of God. There is joy in who he calls you to be. What was the joy set before Christ? Right hand seat to the Father. A seat with God. Fulfilling all of prophecy. Fulfilling the whole reason he came to this earth. Purpose gave him joy. An opportunity to sit at the right hand of the Father gave him joy. Jesus was not joyful about what he was about to endure. He wasn't, he wasn't filled with joy about an event. He was filled with joy about an outcome that was already guaranteed. 
Your outcome is already guaranteed. Your victory has already been won. Your promises are already waiting for you in the hands of the Father. That wasn't on purpose. I almost fell. But he is looking at you saying, come back to the garden. There is joy in the garden. Joy will carry me through. Joy will walk me every phase of my life. Joy is how I get from A to B. Joy, joy is, a, is a choice. It's a perspective. It's a, I'm walking through this valley, but I know what's on the other side. So I fix my eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of my faith, the author of your faith. He's writing your story. Trust the next chapter is coming. He's writing for you this morning in worship. It was so hard. I kept having to look at a man. I'm like, we've got to move. We've got to shift. Because God began a transition this morning for a lot of you in this room. It's almost like he walked you up to the Red Sea and he started parting the waters. We're going to cross this morning. But you've got to be ready to cross. You've got to be ready to cross. You've got to be ready to maybe get a little uncomfortable. You've got to be ready to go to a place you don't want to go. You've got to be ready to address some things you don't want to address. But for what? For the joy set before you. You can endure it. He'll carry you through. One element of joy is his presence. We find joy in his presence. Look at Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. It says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. This was the original purpose of the garden. Community with God, walking in the garden side by side. Can you imagine matching the stride of God in the garden? No fear, no worry, no doubts, no failures. Just walking right beside him. But God's in the garden. And he set boundaries in the garden. Sin hinders everything now, especially man's experience of God's presence. And I want to use that word experience because understand this. You are saved. You are chosen. You're in the hands of God. You don't, uh, uh, Nathan was mentioning earlier, you don't lose the presence of God, but you can't experience it. Your experience of the presence of God is hindered when we push boundaries that he set for us. Our ability to experience, how do we know this? Because God was still in the garden, but Adam and Eve thought he didn't know where they were. He was walking in the garden, just like he always did, yet they felt hidden. And understand, it, the word felt is so important here, because God knew exactly where they were. They felt hidden. Sin and boundaries in life that we push will make you feel just hidden from God. And sometimes it's not sin, guys. Sometimes it's, it, it's just heartbreak. Sometimes it's just a tough season. Sometimes it's just difficulty that is coming. Sometimes it's a sacrifice that he's asking you to make, and you say, God, why would you ask this of me? Why, why would you give me this to walk through? Paul said, I asked daily that he would take that thorn from my side, but he never did. Feel like he's not in the garden with you anymore. And the presence of God that they had once known freely was no longer free. It now came with a condemnation. It now came with a guilt. It now came with, with opposition. But there's joy for you in the presence of God. There is no condemnation in Christ. There is joy for you to, to reveal yourself fully and wholly to the person of God. Laying aside every weight that holds us back. Second thing that we find joy in is in his purpose. There is joy for you in his purposes. Look at Romans 12 too. It says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. 
Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing that way you think. See, that old way of thinking won't bring you into purpose. That's the problem. He he said, look, I'm not coming at you. I'm not throwing stones. I'm saying you can't go where I need you to go thinking the way you're currently thinking. I can't take you there. That's what happened to the Israelites. They got pulled out of captivity. They were pulled out of bondage. They were pulled out of slavery, but they kept thinking like slaves. So we couldn't take them to the promised land because the way you enter, the way you leave one season directly affects how you enter another. I can't let you have the tree of life now because you'll carry with you your current state. I need you to shift your current state so I can take you to the other side. You can't bring with you last season's blessings or last season's prayers or last season's whatever into this season because I've got something new I want to do in you. New I've got to do with you. He's not punishing you. He's saying, God forbid that you enter a next season that you're not ready for and then think you're a failure or that I had something set up for you. I don't know. He's going to prepare you. He's going to prepare you. It's a coach's job to know when a player is ready to get in the game. But your purpose is on the field. Your purpose is on the field. So allow him to guide and direct you with his boundaries, changing the way you think. And then the last part, it says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. The purposes of God. Having a purpose is the difference between making a living and making a life. I'm not here to make a living. I'm here to make a life. I'm here to have purpose. I'm here to to step with, with intention on what God's doing. JFK said it like this, efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. One of my favorite, and a philosopher, he said, When a man doesn't know what harbor he's making for, every wind seems like the wrong wind. Or maybe every wind seems like the right wind. How would you know if you don't know what harbor you're aiming at? Purpose is what drives us. Purpose is what gives us hope. Purpose is why you can get up the next morning even though you were beaten down yesterday because you still have a purpose that wasn't taken from you in loss. Purposes aren't removed from you in defeat. You still have a purpose. You still have an aim. You still have direction. You still have goals. Every single one of us has a general purpose of sharing the love of God with every single person we encounter. But God has a specific purpose and method for each and every one of you. But you've got to find him and find that purpose by changing the way you think. By refusing to believe you're just another face in the crowd. By refusing to believe God can do no great thing with you. By refusing to believe that anything he has for you is predicated on your past. By refusing to believe that failures in your life determine your future. No, he has a purpose for you. And we've got to learn how to walk in it. Because pain without purpose will stop you. Come on, pain for no reason? other day, uh, me and Bishop were working out. It didn't end as great as it started. Bishop, we were on the last set of the last rep of the last workout. And he set the weight down and caught his finger in another weight. Sliced that thing so open. I've never seen my Bishop prayer walk so fast. He goes, ooh! You know how you kind of hit that, like, speed walk? Jesus! Why, God? That, that joke was split. There's that, like, gushy meat coming out. But you know what I can guarantee you? He's going to be back. He's going to be back. Why? Because he has a purpose. He wasn't in that gym for no reason. He made a commitment to his health, to his fitness, so that going through pain when achieving your purpose will not stop you. You get right back up. When I, if I'm working out legs, I'll warm up with like 135 on my back getting squats. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. I got it. 
man, I went to, uh, we went to this men's conference, Tim Tebow's preaching this week. I've never felt smaller in my life. His hamstrings are, boom, I made a commitment to Jesus that day, I will squat heavier. It's unreal. But when I'm squatting or when I'm working out, when I'm lifting weights, I'm okay, I got this. It's hard, it's difficult, it hurts. But I'm going to push through. But when my like 80-pound son flies off the couch and lands on my back, I'm going down. There's no purpose in that. I had no idea it was just coming. Know this, your purpose has pain attached to it. But when it's walking in your purpose, the pain does not stop you. Unpurposed pain? Man, that'll knock the breath out of you. Unpurposed pain. Jesus knew why he was experiencing pain. It was for the joy set before him. His presence will bring you joy. His purposes will bring you joy. As I was reading through Romans chapter 12, and it talks about setting yourself apart, not copying the behaviors and the, and the customs of this world, it, it reminds me of this Old Testament commitment. It's called the Nazarite vow. Nazir or Nazar, the root word means separated. It was a vow someone would make, God, I'm holy and totally yours. They would make this vow for different reasons. Sometimes it was, it was because of something God had just brought them through. Sometimes it was because it was something they wanted him to bring them through. And so they would take this vow, God, I am yours. And now understand, this isn't a, because we do this sometimes, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. It wasn't making a deal. It was consecrating themselves separate to God. I am wholly yours. Take me. So they would make this vow, and look what was entailed in that vow. It's Numbers chapter 6, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, either men or women, take the special vow of a Nazarite, setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way. This was voluntary. Right? He said, don't, he didn't say tell all the people this. No, no, no. He said, if they decide they're going to take this special vow, here's what it entails. Verse 3, they must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine or other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice. They must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from a grapevine, not even the grape seeds or skins. Verse 5, they must never cut their hair throughout the time of their vow, for they are holy and set apart to the Lord. Until the time of their vow has been fulfilled, they must let their hair grow long. And verse 6, and they must not go near a dead body during the entire period of their vow to the Lord. So this was a voluntary commitment. There was a time limit set on it. So each person's vow, they would meet with the high priest, and they would, they would kind of set what they're doing, what is the length of co the commitment, what they're making. And at the end of the commitment, they would have a ceremony where they would be able to, to partake in all the things they'd been abstaining from. Right? So they would have this vow, well, now they're going to be able to touch a dead body because they would be making a sacrifice to the altar of the Lord. They would cut their hair and lay it down before the Lord. And then many times then they would rejoice with wine and other beverages after. But during this time, you can't do that because you are separated and you are mine. Now, there were three people in Scripture who were dedicated to a Nazarite vow, though, prior to their birth. It wasn't voluntary for them. It's the prophet Samuel. Samson the judge and John the Baptist because they already had a purpose and their, their purpose required consecration. Eben got it, but that's just because he had a birthday last week. Your purpose requires separation. He had three people. He said, you know, this is a voluntary vow. This is good, but you, you, and you, if I'm going to accomplish with you what I want to, You've got to be completely separated and given to me. Look at Judges chapter 13. We're going to look at Samson's life today. It said, in those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, even though you've been unable to have children, you'll soon become pregnant and give birth to a son, so be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink or eat any forbidden food because you'll become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut. Let me stop right there. Parents, we can't continue indulging in things we don't want our kids to. Son, you need to have a good attitude. You need to stop using that language. You need to stop doing that. He's talking to Manoah's wife. He said, Mom, there's something in you that has a calling and a purpose. So you better take some of this vow for yourself before it touches your child. 
We wonder why certain things are touching our children. Well, God, I don't know. Uh, somehow it traveled down the hallway into their bedroom. I don't know. You're their covering. A, a, a pregnant mother's job is to protect the seed while it grows. What other job is there? Some of you, maybe it's not a child, but you have a dream growing inside you. You better not touch things that are going to destroy your dream's purpose. So, so you will soon become pregnant, so you must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink or any forbidden fruit. His hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. The Israelites at this point had been ruled and oppressed by the Philistines, I think, at this point for another 40 years. Before Israel had a king, what God kept doing is he would, he would raise up these judges, but they weren't, you know, Judge Judy. It was these chief commanders, these army leaders, these people who the Holy Spirit would descend on and use to do a powerful thing, and it would kind of back off of them. It was a harsh time in Israel because they would give everything to God, and then they'd kind of stray away. So God would have, and so again, every time they strayed, all right, but now you're outside of your covering, so you're under the oppression of the Philistines. So then time and time again, a judge would be raised up, and he would deliver them. So he says, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing Samson, and he's going to deliver the Israelites. But Samson's story kind of takes off. See, see, so the next time we see Samson after he'd been cre- cre- consecrated to God, he finds a Philistine woman. Well, Samson, I don't know how many of you had that conversation with your parents. Babe, I didn't. They didn't try to do this. But so Samson's parents are like, are you sure you want to marry her? Y'all don't look at your in-laws. The, uh, he's like, no, there's this girl from Timna. She cute. I'm going to marry her. And, and his parents are like, are you sure? Let's not do that. And so, so then they start traveling to Timna because he's going to introduce them all together. And it says, while he was near the vineyards of Timna, a young lion attacks him. And he takes the jaws of that young lion and he rips it apart, says, as easy as he would of a goat. I can't rip a goat. So I don't know what that analogy is supposed to do for me. But he took that young lion and just ripped its jaws apart, tore it to shreds. But I have one question. See, he faced the lion, and he won. But why was he near the vineyards of Timnah? First thing he was told as a Nazarite is you can't touch grapes. You can't touch wine. You can't touch the skin of a grape. So why are you in a place that produces things that aren't for you? Why do we wander into places? See, we like to push boundaries. Well, 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 can I, get, I can get right up to this edge. I can just creep right up to it, but I won't, I won't cross it. I won't pass it. And then until we start doing that Christian hokey pokey, and we're like, ooh. And we do that with boundaries and wonder why. Oh, I don't know what happened, God. I just got sucked into temptation. We weren't married, but we were sharing a blanket and watching Netflix. What happened? God, I'm, I'm, I, didn't want, I didn't want to do those things. I don't want to try drugs. I don't want to over drink. I don't want to do that. So I, I, you know, but I left the bar, and it was just the weirdest thing. What's he doing in the vineyards of Timnah? Because he didn't understand his purpose was greater than that, that desire. But he tears up this young lion, so no problem, right? He'd already violated one of his vows. See, we only tell Samson's story from Samson and Delilah, and we're going to get there. But that wasn't the end-all, be-all. It was just the, the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the final thing. Samson pressed his boundaries his entire life and sacrificed his purpose for it. So now he goes, and they have a big party up in Timna, and then they're on their way back, and he sees the dead body of the lion, and some bees have flown in there, and they've, they've formed a hive. Wendy, that would be a really cool hive. Like, y'all probably have those cool, like, boxes, but a dead lion carcass? So he's like, oh, honey, hmm. And watch this. And he goes to a dead place to try to get something sweet. Why are we trying to get sweet things out of dead places? Why are we trying to get satisfaction out of things that have no life for us? 
And look, and I'll tell you this, I'm not condemning anyone in here if you drink or anything like that. Pastor Kirk and I were talking about this the other day. The Bible doesn't make anything clear, but what it does say, don't get drunk. Cool. But I'll just tell you what I do know is I've never had to counsel any couple because the husband was drinking too much Mountain Dew. Well, God, so what's my boundary here? How far can I go then? Why are we asking those questions? Why aren't you asking what his purpose is for your life? I promise you your purpose is worth everything. It's worth everything. So he goes to a dead place to get some honey. The vow too, broken. Then he returns. It's wedding time. They're making the final arrangements. Long story short, he gets in a big fight with his lady, and he leaves. He's like, I'm out of here. Goes back home. Then he does what every future husband does. He says, I need to bring her a gift. So he gets a goat. He's like, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to present her with this goat. We're going to fix all this. And he goes back to her house, and the, her father tells him, we thought you, like, hated her. She's married to your best man. <laughs> I love what Samson says. He goes, all right, now you can't even blame me for what I'm about to do to you. <laughs> all right, that's a pretty baller statement. And then, so, so here's what he does, which is, like, the coolest, weirdest thing anyone's ever done in Scripture. He goes out, and he catches 150 foxes. No, no, two, 300 foxes. And then he ties their tails together in pairs. So now he has 150 pairs of foxes, and he attaches a torch to each one of these tail pairs, lights the torches, and then sets the foxes loose in all of the fields of the Philistines and burns down all of their grain. Who has time to be that vengeful and petty? I can't catch my miniature schnauzer when he gets out of the house. And here's Samson just catching foxes. They're probably like, what you doing? Don't worry about it. Like, and so he burns down all their fields. And then, and then so now the Philistines, because remember, they're still under the rule of the Philistines at this point. So he just, he just went after these people. Because the whole time he put his hands in the, in the will of those who were his oppression. But we'll talk about that another time. So then he goes and he... And, and they're like, all right, we're going to get him. And so the, the Philistines tell the men of Judah, and they're like, y'all better bring her Samson, or we're bringing it to y'all. And so they show up to Samson. They're like, hey, we got to tell you what we're bringing you. They bring him over there. He snaps free, jawbone of a donkey, kills a 1,000 Philistine men. All right, Samson. Maybe now you're back on track. You got this now. You, you, you've learned your lesson. Until he sees another Philistine woman named Delilah. So now they're together. Guys, these women will be the death of you. And so now he's with Delilah, and, and, and the Philistines come. She sells him out for 1,100 pieces of silver. And I guess that's better than what Judas got for Jesus, but still, that ain't cryptocurrency. And so he gets, she sells him out, and then they go. And so now she goes up to Samson. She's like, Samson, what's the secret to your strength? What's the secret to your strength? And he's like, well, if you tie me up with fresh bowstrings, I can't break free. So she ties him up with bowstrings, and then the, the, all the Philistines jump out to attack him. He breaks free and kills him. Samson, you lied to me. And then he's like, oh, I was just playing. If you tie me up with fresh new ropes, I, I'll lose all my strength. So she ties him up with fresh new ropes. What were they doing, by the way? And so ties him up with fresh new ropes, and then all the Philistines break out. And they come, and he snaps them open, and, and then he, and he kills them all. And he's like, he's like, Samson, why do you keep lying to me? He's like, because you keep trying to kill me. But he doesn't say that. Well, if you gave me, I, like, he's got to be playing with her. Because he goes, well, if you give me dreadlocks. I think it might have been a look he always wanted to pull off but didn't have the guts. So he's like, if you give me dreadlocks, then it will go my strength. So she braids up his hair. Boom. They, they bust out. And then they're like, what did you do to your hair? And then he, he breaks free and kills them. And so then finally they come and he, he tells her, look, my secret's my hair. He lays his head in her lap. She cuts off his hair. And they jump out. And I think verse Judges 16, verse 20. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he woke from his sleep and thought, see, he hadn't changed his thoughts. He thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. His strength was gone. It was over. And this all comes down to this one point that I want to ask you. Nehemiah says, we have a certain something that's our strength. What is that? 
Where's your joy this morning? Samson lost his strength. Your strength is the joy of the Lord. And we go through things and we go through trials and we go through situations and, and we, we get down and out. We give up our faith. We give up our hope. We feel defeated and we look up and wonder, where has my joy gone? We don't change our thoughts to think this is going to be, be different than before. I've got to do something different. No, we keep walking the same walk, doing the same thing. Walking around joyless, we have no purpose. We're not, we're not spending time in the presence of God. We're just moseying through life expecting that things are going to change. Guys, I've, I'm there. I've been there. Two weeks ago, I was talking to a coworker, and I was like, I don't really have any faith for my future. I'm going to need you to pick this one up. And I said it kind of as a joke, but you guys know we say those things, hoping someone hears what we're really saying. Samson had nothing. Because when we lose our hope and we lose our joy, the first thing we lose is our vision, and that's what he lost. And here he is, blind, grinding grain, working for the enemy, because he doesn't know what's going to be in front of him. Come on, there are people in this room who haven't felt fulfilling joy in years. And it can be different things. Maybe you've been straying away from God. Maybe you've been, you've been tar- trying to get sweet things from dead places. Maybe you've been pressing boundaries. But maybe you've just experienced loss. Maybe you've just had, had people betray you. Maybe you've, you've just you've thought these things were going to come to be, but they haven't yet. And you don't know how to wait on God's time. But wherever you are, it seems to get a little bit harder step after step after step to keep doing and keep doing, to keep enduring this pain that you're dealing with because it feels like it's without a purpose. You don't have to face that without the presence of God, and you don't have to face that without purpose. And I need you to get ready because one of the most powerful scriptures that will bring you to the other side is the very next verse. See, he's pushing, he's grinding this grain. His eyes are gouged out. And he has nothing to carry him. But in Judges chapter 16, verse 22, it says, But before long, his hair began to grow back. Some of you need to hold on to this verse this morning. That what might seem lost will grow back. That dream you lost will grow back. That child that you think is hopeless will grow back back. Your job that's going nowhere, guess what? Your purpose isn't in that job. Your purpose is in your joy to take ground for the in- again from the enemy, to march right into everything that he's stolen and pull it back to advance the kingdom of God. You find your purpose and you'll find your joy. And in your joy, you'll find his presence. And your joy will grow back. Do not leave this place today without your joy. Do not leave here today without your joy. It's not over. James chapter 1, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. What he's, what's he saying? Don't let opportunity present itself to you and label itself. You count it joy. When life hands you difficulty, you say, thank you for that joy. When life hands you struggle, you say, thank you for more joy. Look how he says it in in the ESV. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. You make a decision that says, I'm going to get my joy back. I'm going to quit letting the world and my circumstance and my situation decide for me. Because it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. It's a focus. Because I fix my eyes on the author and the perfecter of my faith. For the joy set before me, I'll endure it. For my family that needs to see what steadfastness looks like in the face of uh, of adversity, I'll endure that. For people around me in my life who don't seem to have the strength to pick themselves up, I'll endure that. For people who don't know what it's like to be in an environment where all you can do is lead with your faith, and all you can do is lead with who you are, and all you can do is lead with your identity in Christ, I'll endure that for the joy that he set before me. You have to count it joy. Count it 
joy. And in that joy, you'll find presence. In that joy, you'll find purpose. In that joy, you'll find healing. Don't wait to feel joy to get your healing. Count it joy. Count it joy. He didn't say count your blessings. He said count it joy. He didn't say count your miracle. He said count it joy. He didn't say count your favor. Count your zeros in the bank. Count your pride. No, he said count it joy. So I've got to count it joy. There's this, this song that kept coming to my heart that we're singing and um, I don't even remember how old it is. Not that bad. But it goes, you're all I want. And you're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. So watch what he'll do in that. Help me know you are near. So if you need that, stand and sing with me this morning. And you're all I a second, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to close your eyes. I need you to forget everything around you. I need you to forget the garden for a second. And I need you to find your God. Come on, close your eyes across the sanctuary. I'll start calling names. I don't mind. And you put your focus on him. You put your focus on that joy. And maybe you're here this morning and, and, you, and you say, well, I don't feel depressed and I don't feel upset and, I, and I'm not really struggling. Then why doesn't your joy look like your strength? If you have it, use it. And you're all I want. And you're all Don't play all the games. Don't think about it. Don't wait for someone else to come. Right now, altar is open. Right now, altar is open. I see you all through this sanctuary. You don't wait. You don't wait because your presence and your purpose is not dependent on the people around you, and it's not dependent on the opinions of others. When you say, I've been walking, and I've been walking, but I feel weaker, and I feel weaker, and I feel like my strength has left me. We're going to receive the joy of the Lord this morning. And then if you're in this room and say, I got my joy, I'm good. Then as we continue to sing for just another minute, I want you to stretch your hands to your brothers and sisters who could probably use somebody to lift them up. Because when you got your joy, it's not just for you. Samson's purpose and his presence was to free and rescue and deliver his people. So when you get your joy, you don't keep it. You use it for others. In his last moments, he, he cries out to God. And he said, God, I know what I did, but I'm praying you give me one more time. And in this one more time, I'm going to fall right back into everything you intended me to do. And he stretches out his hands on the pillars of the Colosseum with every eye of oppression that are on him. The, everyone in there, they're watching him. They're laughing at him. They're using him for their own amusement. When the world wants to use me for their amusement, that's absolutely fine. But I'm going to come right back at them with the presence and the purpose of my God. And in one push... In one push, says he killed as many Philistines in that one moment than that he had in his entire career, his entire life as a judge, that one moment. Maybe you're just one push away. Maybe you're just one push away. So we're going to continue to sing because well, what do we find that in? This isn't a fight my battles moment. This is God help me know you're near. Because in your nearness, God, I have strength. 
In your nearness, I have purpose. In your nearness, I'm lifted. Because you're all I want. Oh, you're all. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. Oh, sing God, you are going to make themselves available if you want prayer, if you want to come into agreement with somebody, if you want to get your strength back this morning, don't leave here feeling weak, don't leave here feeling depleted, because see, the situation that you're walking back into may not have changed, but you have. The loss that you experienced might not be vindicated when you walk back out these doors, but we've changed the way we thought about it, and I've, I've identified my purpose in his presence that when he brings me through a trial or whatever, but the defeat presents itself to me, I will count it. I will count it. I will count it. Find your joy. Find your strength. But it all happens when you find yourself in him. Lift your hands as I bless you this morning. God, we, we are so grateful, so grateful for your power, God. So grateful for your joy. So grateful for your mercy. God, I pray that there will not be a single person in this room who leaves here without the strength in their life that is your joy for them, God. Continue to lift, to bless, to speak. We are holy and completely yours. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Unite us in your presence. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We love you so, so much. We're going to stay in worship as long as you need. Come up for prayer for anything that you need. We'll see you next week for Mother's Day service. Invite somebody who needs to get their strength back. We'll see you next week.